All right, rolling right along, we've got um, win friends and influence people with our Lemmy. And I can't wait to hear this. You're you're basically Dale Carnegie here for the API world. Is that right? <laughs> it is. It is. Okay. Oh, at least I'll try. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll put you on the clock and then give me a few minutes at the end for questions because I think there's going to be a lot to talk about. Indeed. And it's up to you. Cool. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I need to leave some minutes at the end, and my talk is already pretty long, so I'm going to jump straight into it. Um, I don't want to lose too much time from the start. Um, yeah, my talk is how to win friends uh, and influence people with API first. And my name is Ali Mitchell-Polt. Uh, I'm a senior developer advocate at Postman, which is a company that you may know. Um, the talk is not going to be about Postman specifically, but I do want to give a, a quick overview of what Postman does. Um, and I have just that one slide to highlight it. So we've actually just announced we, um, we reached 20 million users, uh, I think, a month back. Uh, but Postman is an API platform, and we uh, we are the go-to platform for the whole API lifecycle. So from the moment where you start designing your um, your API, you think of designing your API as an API uh, producer, all the way to someone, uh, an API consumer comes in and starts uh, using and consuming your API. Um, one of the thing about Postman, as I mentioned, we have 20 million users. My job is talking to them. Um, admittedly, I'm not talking to the 20 millions one by one, but we do this type of events where we get to meet uh, some of our users, whether like through talks, workshops, or at the booth, and we get to learn from them. Um, and this talk is kind of based of all of these interactions. But um, to start with, here's a poor Photoshop job I did of uh, taking that, that Carnegie book and putting my title on it. Um, and what are we going to do today? I'm not going to read you a book, but I have a few things that I do want to go through. Um, and here's the here's the agenda. So we start with just making sure that everyone here understands what API first is and that we all agree to the same definition, at least so we're on the same page. Um, we look at the benefits of being or becoming API first. Then I share some tools and workflows that um, API first enables. We'll um, scatter some industry examples throughout the talk. Uh, and at the end, just before we leave, I'll give some key points uh, and then we'll have Q&A. So uh, to get started, as I mentioned, we want to make sure that we all have the same definition. And one of the things we do um, at Postman, we do the state of the API survey, which is a yearly survey that we send to uh, thousands of, of uh, participants. I think last year was 28,000 people. Um, and we ask them for you, what is API first? And that's the, that's the four main, answer, main answers that came back. Uh, one of them being, I'm not sure. Uh, some people, I'm not sure what API first is. And then we have, um, 89% that uh, said they were familiar, but then they were split on what exactly it is. So it can be defining and designing APIs all the way from the start, um, maybe developing the API before the application, or defining the business requirement before moving on defining and designing the API. Um, but to kind of explain what API first is, I'm going to take the opposite, and I'm going to look at what the opposite of uh, API first is, which is code first. Uh, so we've got first, uh, how does that work? You start coding your application and you build your connections with all the different other applications that you may need, microservices, et cetera. And then you slap an API on top of it. Once you have that API, you can have um, other uh, application using it. Uh, but then maybe you have another service that needs to consume that API. So you need to rework some stuff to make sure that you have these functionalities, et cetera. Uh, and now maybe you have a third party, another uh, backend service that need to use that same API, but it doesn't work. So you need to put another API on top. And probably you're seeing something here, um, which is that there's a lot of work to be done on the API as the needs evolve. And one of the company uh, that actually went through that uh, is Etsy. And what they did is uh, they realized that all of the code that was built for their website had to be rebuilt in their API to be used by their other apps. And the way I see that, um, and an easier way for me to describe what happens when you're kind of just building the back end, building the front end on the other side, and then trying to connect the things, is uh, yeah, this this image that someone tweeted, uh, Tor Winter tweeted uh, uh, about a year back, um, which is what happens when you don't have clear requirements or clear uh, business requirements, and you just try to connect things that may not match. In an API first. 
uh, development, uh, API-first uh, development cycle, you already have um, the, the API, so your interface, and you're thinking about your potential customers, right? Like you're, um, you're thinking about uh, the business who are going to use it, what data they need, et cetera. Um, and then your application engineer will be the first consumers of the API. That paves the way for, uh, for more things to connect. And because you've actually thought through all of your consumers, you only need to work on the API first, and then you can connect all of the things one by one and have all of this happening in parallel. So the web app is going to work one way, the admin application team is going to work the other way, et cetera. Um, so that's very schematically. Now let's have a look at it um, tactically. You've got first, as I mentioned, you start with the code, you commit that code, and you start integrating it with your different services. Um, and then just only once your code is integ integrated, you can move into testing it, debugging, documenting it, et cetera. Um, this is not how you make friends. Um, the problem with that, there's obviously bottlenecks uh, because we're waiting for that code to be committed in order to uh, have all of these other teams starting the test, the documentation, et cetera. Uh, there might be we work late in the development cycle. Um, let's say you realize once you've uh, published some of the code that that uh, third party needed something else to come back from your API, then you need to um, to rework it. But also you might be building stuff that no one wants. Um, the documentation may, may be lacking because people were not aware of what was going to be built. They only discover as you uh, integrate. Uh, and then obviously you're constrained by the data model and the business logic because you already have uh, this data model that's already baked in. If you want to build more stuff on it, then you might be limited by it. Uh, in the API first, uh, tactically, how does it look? You're doing the designing, um, and because you have um, all different types of, um, of folks working on it, maybe design, architect, et cetera, working on it, um, you can agree on a plan of what's going to happen, and then you can start generating things from uh, that API definition. So you, uh, I think um, in, in the previous talk, the, the, they mentioned the, the API definitions that allows you to be that contract between things. So you define that contract uh, between all these different parts. And then you can generate generate code or have a team that writes this code. Um, and once you have that, then you commit and uh, you can have a loop that uh, works. I'm, I'm going to come back to that a bit later. So I don't want to spend too much time on this. And that's, uh, to me at least, how you make friends. Uh, you have earlier validation. Um, so getting feedback earlier in the development cycle so your team can adapt to new inputs. Um, and you keep the cost low, right? Because you don't have to rework a lot of stuff when, when something new happens. Uh, you're decoupling dependencies, uh, whether it's developer, testers, technical writer, they can work independently just from that API definition. Uh, faster growth, um, because having your stakeholders involved early in the design process uh, allows for more diverse scenarios. Uh, and you can scale more quickly than two other apps, devices, and platform, as we showed it, as we saw in the in the first uh, in the first schemas. Uh, and freedom from construct uh, because you're focusing on the API instead of the code, and you're thinking uh, with a more holistic view of what you're trying to build. So these are the benefits down the line. And there's a few companies that went through that and are like famously API first now. Uh, one of them is Netflix. Uh, because of the time, I'm not going to read through all of that. Uh, but they realized that um, API first enable rapid innovation uh, with quick uh, decoupled de development cycles. Um, these slides are shared later. So if you want to read this whole thing, you can also come back to it. Another company about that is AWS when it, with the AWS API mandate, it was called, when uh, Jeff Bezos stole all their teams. Now each team needs to be an API. And you need to be able to like uh, use each of these microservices through APIs. Uh, so now let's go back at what we saw at the start. Uh, there's these different definitions of what API first is, uh, but the one that comes back the most is this one. API first is designing and designing APIs in schema before doing any development. Um, so that's, that was the one with the most answers. So now let's kind of dig into um, the tools and workflows for APIs. Like, hopefully here we're on the same page. Uh, we, we understand what API first means and the difference between API first and code first. But how do you how do you get there? Um, so there's tools and workflows, and I'm going to go through three of them. There's plenty more, and I've seen, uh, I think there was a talk from uh, Dolby a bit earlier where they mentioned uh, that website called openapi.tools, uh, which lists uh, 
tens and tens of um, of tools that you can use for uh, for APIs or, or API first um, development, etc. So you can also check that one. But uh, today I'm going to talk about API specifications, mock servers, and CDC testing or consumer driven contract testing. So let's uh, start with API specification. If you're at API days um, and you've attended a couple talks prior, it's Chances are it's not the first time you hear about API specifications, but let's just make clear that we're all like, aware of the different ways uh, th this name is used. So first you have uh, a description format, uh, which is the, um, the, the open API uh, one, two, three, maybe RAML, maybe GraphQL, et cetera. So that, uh, that's the specification you're gonna abide by for your API. Um, and then you have how your API works and that's the API description document or uh, API definition, as we call it. So that, that, that is going to be your open API uh, file. And then you have uh, how uh, to consume that API, how to use that API, and that's your API reference. That's something you can generate from the open API uh, definition, and that's your API reference. Um, now, again, one of the questions we asked the people uh, when we did uh, that survey last year, uh, we looked at which um, which specification they were using the most. Um, so you can see the dark blue is they use it and love it. Light blue is they use it. Uh, yellow, they're aware, but they don't use it. And then red, they've never used it. So JSON schema came like way on top. Uh, the reason for that is because it's a description format, but it's used for uh, not just describing APIs, it's um, like any data exchange format, not any, but a lot of them use JSON schema uh, to describe their, their data. Um, second in the list is Swagger 2.0, uh, and then we have OpenAPI 3.0, GraphQL, ACK API, which I think there's a whole track of during API days uh, that I recommend checking as well, uh, and then a few other ones. So we also looked at um, the consumption within Postman uh, at the data we could get, and we got like, kind of similar results. Obviously, we don't have JSON schema. It's not uh, uh, API description format, but um, Swagger 2 and OpenAPI 3.0 were coming up uh, first. So let's look at um, OpenAPI. So what you can do with OpenAPI, um, if you're in Postman, surprise, I work at Postman, so I'm going to demo in Postman. Uh, you can draft your uh, your OpenAPI uh, definition in Postman. You're going to get like direct validation of uh, some errors. So you can see here, uh, there were some errors that were shown. He was uh, missing uh, R, so he did not recognize that the, um, that the type of array uh, was not recognized. And then you can actually collaborate on this. So that's the whole defining and designing as a team. So you can actually get other stakeholders involved. So here, uh, my colleague is telling me and they're asking me, oh, can you add um, this endpoint to, um, to my API definition? So I would get a notification and then we can actually go author uh, that, that API definition. Um, nope. The next one, next tool I mentioned is mock servers. Uh, mock servers is um, is a way to, instead of having to code the whole API, just from this API definition, you can generate a fake server that's going to ret return generated data uh, implied from uh, how, how you've described your API. And then this allows you to provide it to other people so they can start working on it. So in that example, um, you can see uh, I have this open API and I can go in it and create a new mock server based on that API definition. So I'll uh, give it a name. Uh, it's going to generate a collection. So this collection is going to be uh, the different requests that are defined. And then I can have uh, the mock server. I could make it private, et cetera, but here we just go with the defaults. Uh, and then this gives me that URL. And that's the URL I can share with uh, maybe the front end team if I want them to start integrating with my API and see how it would look um, on their, on their uh, UI. Um, instead of me having to, again, create everything from scratch and then give them the finished product. So here you can see I'm uh, adding the mock URL as a as a variable in Postman. And now I can send that request and it's going to return uh, some generated data that is just taken from the API definition. I didn't have to write any code, etc. It's just using what the API definition um, has in there. And then uh, so as I mentioned, you can generate from API specification and you can uh, prototype new services, which um, I could update that mock server as I go. And again, I could have 
my documentation in the start documenting the API. I can have my front end in the start integrating. I could also have some other squads within my company starting to see how they would leverage that API. Um, the last thing I mentioned is kind of a mouthful every time, but consumer driven contract testing. Um, and this one is a bit um, harder to explain if you're not very familiar with this. So and when it's hard to explain, I just put a meme, which is almost out of date already because um, Squid Game is too old. It's at least a year old, but uh, contract um, contract driven, consumer driven contract testing is something that uh, avoids things from breaking uh, once you're in production. So uh, with a schema uh, to better explain it, there's, there's a few steps. So first you're the API provider. Uh, you have this API definition. And I think that's again, that's something that was mentioned before. That's your contract. And you tell your consumers, here's my API definition. This is how you should use my API. Once the consumer has that, they can start writing tests. Uh, so they'll test uh, that whenever they call that API, they always get a response that contains uh, specific data, specific um, parameters, et cetera. Uh, and they send it back to the provider. Then it creates that contract between the consumer and the provider or consumers and the provider. Um, and now the provider, whenever they release a new version of the API or they make an update to an endpoint, et cetera, as part of your pipeline, um, you run your consumer uh, consumer tests and you make sure you're not breaking them. That allows you to uh, ensure your consumers that you're not going to break their workflows. Uh, that also avoids you waking up one day with like a lot of emails or a lot of missed calls from your consumers that say, you brought this thing into production and now you owe me that much money. Um, so yeah, it, it's ensuring that providers will fit consumer expectations. We actually use that at Postman. Um, so Postman is split in squads. Each squad has its own blueprint connection that is um, generated from an API definition. And then all of the other different squads, they'll uh, work based on that API definition to integrate and then uh, share different uh, collection tests that each of them can run um, at a time to make sure they're not breaking all their squads work. So before we finish, because you can already see that the time is flying and we want to make sure that there's time for questions. Um, let's go back to the key points for uh, becoming API first. So first we saw there's various meaning. Um, there's API first development, which is developing a new functionality, but starting by the API. So for example, Twitter spaces is a great example of that. Uh, any feature in Twitter spaces is first available in the API, and then they even allow their third party uh, developers to create on top of that. And then they may include it in the tool, but it's always first available. For example, their search endpoint has been available on the API first. And then there's API first design, which happens before. Uh, and that's really deciding even before you get to write your API definition, uh, what functionality will the API have, what data is going to be exposed, how will it scale, et cetera. Uh, so the benefits of that, uh, I mentioned before, four benefits, four main benefits, there's others, but I'm just going to go through these four. Early validation, uh, decoupling dependencies, faster growth, uh, and freedom from constraints. Um, not going to go in details, uh, but that's the that's the four main one that uh, you should you should remember. Um, I'll actually give one last quote uh, from someone who took part in the state of the API survey. Um, so that's Andrew Carlo, I think, um, who's a VP of development, who said API first in organization means that we can think of what is possible rather than what is not possible when it comes to providing the best features and functionality for product and services to our members. We no longer have the difficulties of customization or integrations with these systems and implication. And that goes back to like that previous slide, right? Because um, you're decoupling dependencies. You're not um, you're not tied to the choices you made from the start in your uh, development, for example. Uh, one last thing. So I've mentioned the state of the API survey many times. Uh, I don't actually have a link in that slide, but um, if you just Google state of the API postman, you'll find all the resources that's probably the one of the most uh, complete API survey out there. Um, so, and we have, we're already working on the 2022 one. I don't have a release date, but we're working on it. And another thing I do want to mention is that uh, book, which there is a, there is a hard cover of it. Uh, but if you don't want to get the hard cover, you can also, um, you can also just go to api first worldcom And it's a, it's a graphic novel where we kind of highlight our view of what, a, what, what an API first world is. 
Um, with that said, I think I have about five minutes left. So thank you all for your time. Uh, and while we go through q and I just want to make sure I can put the, these links on, uh, and then you can just write them down while I, while I answer yeah. some questions. <laughs> Thank you, Art. Let me, let's leave those on the screen because that's good stuff. I just put the uh, State of the API survey link in the chat. Oh, thank you. Well. Thank you. Um, you got a shout out for your workshop yesterday. So lots of Postman fans out there. A question for you is, we all know how to win friends and influence people using APIs now. What are the anti-patterns, Arlemi, that you might see that can be subtle in terms of uh, getting people to really understand API first, what, what are the obstacles? Um, obstacles is often your business needs. Mm -hmm. um, so you would start with, there, there's and one quote that I actually removed right before uh, doing the talk. I have one slide which says, it's going to be hard. Because API first, as much as you want to do it, um, it, it takes a lot of time beforehand and some business want to move fast. Uh, and API first is not for everyone, right? Like you might be just a, Every, maybe you're just a student that wants to do like your little project. It's not for you. Uh, and maybe your business is in the company will change. Um, so you start with API first and like plenty of goodwill. Uh, you want to make sure that everything is released in the API, etc. But then uh, someone in your business says, oh, actually, uh, I have this new team. Or maybe we have acquired a company and we need to integrate with them and they were not API first. There's, there's going to be uh, tons of reasons why API first may not like uh, succeed at your company. Um, I'm not really saying any anti pattern here, but one of them is 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 mostly you start with API first, but then you kind of forget that uh, you have so many things that are reliant on your API definition, and you just start having different teams plugging into it, starting to push little lines of code here and there, yeah. and yeah, you, you you break the the benefits of having this source of truth. Yeah. Okay. So, follow up question on that is. As APIs grow, mature, maybe change ownership, change purpose, um, Hiram's law may play out. How does that impact documentation, the contract testing? How does that play out? Yeah, so there's, um, it depends how big the changes are. Um, I think one of the things I do not mention at all is versioning, uh, but versioning mm -hmm. in the API world is super important and you wanna yeah. make sure um, if we look at the last part where I talked about contract testing, you want to make sure you're never breaking your consumer's workflows. Um, so there's, um, th th sorry, two sides to your question. First, the first part is versioning. That's what allows you to not break anything. Uh, the second part you mentioned, how do we keep everything up to date? Um, so that's, that's one of the benefits of API first, because you have your source of truth, which is the API definition. And we have all of these tools, some that I've mentioned today, but even more that are out there that can be generated from that API definition. If you manage to keep that space where everyone is working just on that entity, which is your API definition, and then from this, you can update uh, your documentation. And I think there was a talk again earlier that was mentioning this. So we have a uh, read up here, et cetera, that can take an API definition as a, as a parameter, uh, for example, Postman as well, right? Um, you can uh, generate your mock servers. And anytime you have a change to your API, you have a new version that release, you want to make sure you update all these API elements, as I call them, uh, to make sure that uh, they, they stay in track. And then again, uh, it, it's very much a matter of making sure that everyone is aware within the company that yeah. your source of truth is that. And again, Twitter being a great example of that uh, for the Spaces API, but also for the overall Twitter uh, API v2, which is uh, API first. Uh -huh. OK, that makes a lot of sense. Again, Arlemi, thank you so much for that. Um, you. And you've given us a lot to think about and a way to get in touch with you. So perfect. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Take care.